much. Thank you, Sam, for organising this, the third PHC conference. Thank you for attending and giving up what was probably your wedding invite somewhere down the road. <laughs> it's much appreciated. I'll crack straight on. For those of you who've watched me present before, bottom left-hand corner, I put references if there are any for that particular slide. So not to clutter up the slide, just make a little note of the number on the bottom left, and you can find them on my website with the forward slash PHC 2018. Anne Widdicombe. Probably the closest that a Tory MP got to becoming a national treasure when she performed on Strictly Come Dancing in 2010. Now, you may not know that her reality TV career started in approximately 2002 when Anne was a contestant on something called Celebrity Fit Club. And at the end of Celebrity Fit Club, Anne said, if she ever wrote a diet book, it would be just two pages long. Page one would say, eat less, and page two would say, do more. And her entire book would be bollocks. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that wasn't the word I intended there, but I couldn't think of another one. Why do we say, eat less, do more? Two reasons. Because we think there is a general principle that says calories in equals calories out. And I do like how that abbreviates to psycho. <laughs> We also think that there is a specific formula. To lose one pound of fat, you need to create a deficit of three and a half thousand calories. And I'm sure you've seen that in Women's Health magazine, if not in government literature. So why do we say that there is a principle of calories in and calories out? Because we think that there is a law of thermodynamics that says calories in equals calories out. And before we see if that's true, we just need to understand where the laws of thermodynamics came from. Because thermo means heat and dynamics means movement. And they're about the movement of heat. And they came about because scientists and engineers were trying to work out if we could make a perfectly efficient steam engine. And that started in the early 1700s. The first steam engine was developed around 1712. The first locomotive came along in the early 1800s, and the first use of the term thermodynamics is believed to have occurred in 1854. So they were about steam engines, they were about trains, they were about the movement of heat. They weren't about dieting, although they do apply to the human body. So what are the laws of thermodynamics? The first law, which is a lot of people seem to think there is only one law, is also known of, as the law of conservation of energy. In a closed system, in thermal equilibrium, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it shall be conserved. That's the conservation of energy. There is a very important second law, which is sometimes called the law of common sense. It can be expressed in a number of different ways. It was expressed by some of the scientists as heat will always move from the warmer body to the colder body, not the other way around. And entropy, this is the law of entropy, the second law, entropy literally means a gradual decline into disorder. So you can also express the second law as in, if you put heat into a system, it will become more disordered and more and more disordered over time. Now, the one that matters in the world of dieting is this one. Energy will be lost and energy will be used up in making available energy. And the reason I headlined this presentation, kettles, is because it's a lot less frightening than thermodynamics. And the kettle beautifully illustrates what's going on with thermodynamics. And we boil the kettle several times a day. So the heat moves from the element to the colder water. That's the movement of, of heat transference with entropy. But then, notice what happens, energy is lost. Energy is used up in making available energy. The kettle itself gets hot. We didn't need that to happen. Energy is going out of the spout. That is not helpful. That's inefficiency. And if you don't have an automatic kettle and you leave it on the heat, you'll see what happens. It bubbles and bubbles and bubbles and increasingly tends towards disorder. So the kettle, to me, is the greatest example of what's happening with the laws of thermodynamics. Now, there are actually four laws. We only need to worry about those two in the world of dieting. The final law, every law group has to have a parameter, the boundaries. And so the third law simply says the circumstances in which the laws don't apply. It never happens, so we don't need to worry about that. 
And then they went back at the end of their development of the laws and said, you know, we made an implicit assumption that if object A is in equilibrium with B and B is in equilibrium with C, then A is in equilibrium with C. So they recognised that they had to put that in as one of the laws because they had made that implicit assumption. So what did we get wrong? Well, first of all, there is no law that says energy in equals energy out. There is a law of conservation and it is different. <laughs> Secondly, entropy tells us that a calorie is not a calorie. And this work was first developed beautifully. There's your first great reference to note. Number two, Tappy, Luke Tappy, 1996, worked out the thermic effect of feeding. The difference in energy used up in making available energy depending on where that energy came from. And Tappy found out that if you eat fat, about 2 to 3% of it is used up in making available energy. Carbohydrate, it's about 5 to 10%. Protein, it's about 20 to 30%. There's the metabolic advantage of protein. So if you have 100 calories of pure carbohydrate sucrose, you've got about 92 and a half available. If you have 100 calories of pure protein, the closest that would be would be egg white omelets. Then you've got approximately 72 and a half calories available. Another great paper that shows law two is by Eugene Fine and Richard Feynman. They actually published a paper in 2004 that said if a calorie were a calorie, it would defy the second law of thermodynamics because we know that it isn't. We also got wrong the fact that energy in and energy out are dependent, not independent variables. If you don't put coal in the steam engine, it doesn't go anywhere. If you don't put petrol in the car, it doesn't go anywhere. We try to behave as if we can change one and nothing's going to happen to the other, and we can no longer keep doing that. And we flip between energy and weight as if they're interchangeable. So what do the laws of thermodynamics, movement of heat, say about weight? I've not forgotten to put anything on that slide. That is what the laws of thermodynamics <laughs> say about weight. <laughs> And I'll give you a really great illustration of why they don't say anything about weight. They are about energy. Put approximately one pound weight of coal into a coal station, a power station, and you'll get about one kilowatt hour energy of electricity. Energy will have been conserved. Energy will have been lost and will have been used up in weight making available energy. Weight has nothing to do with any of that. So how do we come about this weight conversion? One pound, three and a half thousand calories, that's the deficit you need to create. Well, not covering it here today because I did it two years ago at the PHC conference in 2016. That reference will take you there. One pound does not even equal three and a half thousand calories. So we're not off to a good start. And what I wanted to understand, because I couldn't work out where this formula came from, was let's ask the powers that be where this formula comes from because they are using it quite a lot of the time. So the powers that be that I asked, an uh, auspicious selection from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, Department of Health, dietitians all over the place, the NHS, and so on. And the first three quite honestly replied and said, we're really sorry. Uh, yes, we're familiar with the formula, but we've got no idea where it comes from. Um, the National Health Service said, try the Department of Health. The National Obesity Forum said, try the Association for the Study of Obesity. And two of them had a crack at it. And we'll see on the next slide how well they got on. Interestingly, I don't know entirely where this formula comes from. My best guess from research that I've been doing is that a woman called Lulu Hunt Peters, and she was sort of a bit of the Gillian McKeith of her day, it would appear, <laughs> wrote a book in 1918 called Diet and Health. And in it, she put this passage, 500 calories equal approximately two ounces. If you cut back by about 1,000 calories a day, then you will lose about 96 pounds over the year. And the reason I think she may have developed this is she put in her little booklet, which is freely available now on the internet. The words are clever, I wrote them myself. And I don't think she was being arrogant. I think she was saying, guys, this is original. This is my original thinking. Now, the problem with that original thinking is that if the calorie theory worked and you did lose 96 pounds with a calorie deficit of 1,000 a day over the next year, I could be six pounds in a year's time. <laughs> and I'm glad you laughed because that's clearly not going to happen. So will we lose one pound for each 3,500 calorie deficit? And I wondered what is the best evidence to show that we will not. 
And in my 2010 obesity book, I covered these first ones, the very famous study from Benedict. We're going back 100 years now. We've then got the Minnesota Starvation Experiment from Ansel Keys in 1950, Stunkard and McLaren Hume, I think their research in 1959 might be where the 98% of diets fails comes from because they observed only 2% of people were 20 pounds down in two years despite having had stones to lose. France is one of my absolute favourite studies from 2007, a meta-analysis, 26,000 people, 80 different weight loss studies followed for up to four years. They were lucky to be three or four kilograms down at the end of that four-year period. Now measure that up against the promise of 100 pounds every year if you can keep up that calorie deficit. I could have bought that book up to date now with some great studies from this year, the Gardner study, healthy low fat versus healthy low carb. There was a calorie deficit of 200,000 calories during the trial from both groups, they should have lost 60 pounds in fat alone. They lost just over 10. And Kevin Hall, um, who is as fascinated with the 3,500 calorie theory as I am, had a go at updating the formula very recently. It was my Monday note for my supporters, and it's more accurate than the 3,500 calorie theory. It would be difficult to be anything other than that, but it still doesn't give us a formula. So, back to those organisations that I asked, where does it come from and please can you prove it? This is Dietitians in Obesity Management. There's good evidence if you cut back by 600 calories a day for a year, you'll be about 5 kilograms down. Fascinatingly, the Association for the Study of Obesity came back with exactly the same study. And they put a little bit more flesh on the bones, and it turned out to be a study of 12 people on that 600 calorie a day deficit, and apply the formula, they should have all been 63 pounds of fat alone down at the end of that study. There was a range. On average, they were about 11 pounds lighter, but the range was from under one pound, which as my husband says is just a good trip to the toilet, <laughs> to about 17 pounds at the upper end of the scale. And that's just fat. We know that we will lose more on top in terms of water and lean tissue. That wasn't factored in. And we've got one and a half billion overweight people in the world. And the best powers that be cannot prove this formula with 12 of them. So the challenge goes back. I'm not going to try and prove it. I'm interested in finding one study from 100 years or further back that actually shows that that formula holds. Will we gain one pound for each 3,500 calorie surplus? Um, no, no more than we will lose a pound. Um, this was a story I also covered in my 2010 book. Lisa, bless her, 630 pounds, consuming over 9,000 calories a day. And the narrator said during the program, if she continues to eat her 9,000 calorie a day diet, she'll gain 56 pounds every month. They probably filmed her for a month. I mean, surely they observed. She hasn't changed her dress. She's still in the same. She didn't suddenly gain two stone. People don't think when there's a formula that has been used and trotted out for decades and decades, they don't challenge it. Now, all that they did to come up with that was to say her basal metabolic rate, let's say it was 3,000 calories, so calculate what the 6,000 calories would turn into, which is almost two pounds every day. Where do those calories go, those 6,000 calories? I don't know. I just know where they don't go, and they don't go into weight at the rate of 56 pounds a month. Human beings are not bomb calorimeters. We could all have liposuction right now and put our deposits in a bomb calorimeter and we would come out with different calorie values for our own one pound of fat. Bozenrad, 1911, said probably somewhere between 72 and 87% of our human tissue is actually body fat. So we'd have quite a range. But as for the body giving that up just because you want it to, that's a whole different ball game. So let's now mix in energy balance with those two things. Energy balance with the general principle, and we've got calories in and calories out. Energy balance with the specific formula, and it is absurd as if we can get somebody to eat less to the tune of 500 calories, if we can get them to do more to the tune of 200 calories, they will lose 0.2 pounds of fat. Oh, no, they won't. So let's have a little bit more of a look at this. Calories in, 
equals calories out, except it doesn't. You know that there isn't a law, but we're playing along with the psycho people. Who remembers <laughs> algebra? That's so all you have to know about calories in, calories out. If you want to believe calories in, calories out, we'll come with you for a slide. So if you remember algebra, all you have to remember about that formula is you do the same to both sides. As long as you do the same to both sides, you've not broken any, any laws. So if you take a number of calories away, do it to both sides and you're absolutely fine. Now, Peter Brooker and I obviously browse the same porn sites because we came up with the same picture. <laughs> Sam's getting a lot of coverage today, and it's just the best six-pack in the UK, isn't it? I mean, you know, why is that not the men's health colour? We, we don't know. But calories in plus a topless Sam Feltham, calories out, topless Sam Feltham, you're, you're doing okay. 75% um, of calories in, 75% of calories out. So as long as you do the same thing to both sides, if you believe calories in equals calories out, notwithstanding there is no law that says that, then you have to believe fewer calories in equals fewer calories out. And that, of course, is what happens. So our poor woman here, let's say she manages to eat less, she manages to do more, she's got nine systems in the body that can then respond to what has just happened. And if any of you know somebody who's been quite extreme on a low calorie diet, particularly if they've tipped over into anorexia, you know how many of those systems can shut off. You know that the reproduction system shuts down in anore anorexics surprisingly quickly. The endocrine system, similarly. Periods stop, let alone reproduction. Lymphatic system, we get that puffy, low calorie, high carb face look. The circulatory system, anorexics are cold, they grow little fine hair all over their body to compensate. The body can and does adjust. The body is not a cash machine for fat. The body is not going to dish out 0.2 pounds just because you created a 700 calorie deficit. And guys, if you're still believing this, you psycho people, there's something that's going to stop your cash machine working. Because if you've got insulin present in that human body, the cash machine is not going to work at all. And we'll come back to insulin on the last slide. If you ever doubt whether or not the body can and does adjust, and um, apologies if this is a little bit of a shocking slide, but it will make it memorable for you, this is what happens to the body to stop it going down to six pounds because you created that calorie deficit. Now, this brave woman took part in an ad campaign <coughs> to try and tackle the problem of anorexia in the fashion industry. She'd been anorexic since a teenager, now 27, and quite shocking weights for her height. So energy balance. Let's look at this energy balance thing a bit more closely. Energy in equals energy out. That's what they want us to start off with. Energy in is greater than energy out. They say that equals weight gain. Energy out is greater than energy in, and they say that equals weight loss. Do you see what just happened? They jumped straight to weight. Who said anything about weight? We were talking about energy, and the body can and does adjust. So we're going to break down energy in and energy out in a little bit more detail. So let's stop saying energy in equals energy out, because there is no law that says that. We have energy in, and we have energy out. And we know at a far deeper level than they tackled with that woman, Lisa, where they just said it's 6,000 calories beyond BMR. We know that total energy expenditure is what we should be looking at for energy out, and we know that it has a number of component parts, basal metabolic rate, physical activity level, the thermic effect of feeding, which we've touched on, and non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So let's have a closer look at energy in. Now, when you believe that you need to eat less and or do more because you believe that energy in equals energy out, you start doing some really dull things. And one of the dullest things I've ever seen is this. And this is called Aspire Assist. No doubt it wishes to assist you to be the person you aspire to be. So you literally attach a tube through your belly button directly into your stomach. You eat what you want and it goes down the toilet. That's medicalized bulimia, but it is a weight loss treatment recognized by the medical profession. Now, things like the norovirus. I know people who are watching their weight who are happy when they get the norovirus. 
because they lose a few pounds in a couple of days. Despite the fact they feel like they've died, they lose a couple of pounds. Not chewing food would be a really good idea if you want some calories to end up in the pan, but it's not going to be good for your immune system or your vitality and to thrive as a human being. Does anyone remember the F-Plan diet from the 1980s? I'm getting a few nods here. Um, you know, when people have a crisis in their life, they'll often say, you know, the bottom's fallen out of my world. Well, the principle of the F-Plan diet, <laughs> you're ahead of me. The world was supposed to fall out of your bottom because you were supposed to eat so much fibre that your body can't digest fibre and it all ended up in the pan and the calories in therefore didn't count. So now let's look a little bit more at energy out, which we're going to expand to be total energy expenditure, and we're going to look a little bit more at basal metabolic rate. Now, basal metabolic rate is by far the major component of our total energy expenditure, unless you're Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps or Chris Froome or whatever, it's by far the major part. It's about 45 to 70 percent of total energy expenditure, and it drops dramatically when we reduce energy in. And we have known this for 100 years. And we go back again to that Benedict study from 1919. And Benedict's research question was, if I can drop the weight of 12 men by 10%, what will happen to their metabolic rate? Will I also drop that by 10%? He found out in fewer than four months, he dropped their basal metabolic rate by 37%. They had to eat over a third less than they had been eating before the experiment to not regain the weight that they lost during the experiment. And we've recently brought that up to date with the direct study, the reversal of type 2 diabetes with a very low calorie diet. It wasn't clear in the Lancet paper what the follow-up diet was. I had some very helpful correspondence with Professor Taylor and one of his dietitian assistants on the study. And the news I got back was basically that those people would have to cut back their calorie intake by one third ongoing. Now, that's what I call the small print. And if any of you as GPs are advising people to eat less, do more, go away and follow a calorie-controlled diet, please give them the small print. Please tell them they now have to sign up to having a third less than is satiating them at the moment for the rest of their life. Because I think they might say to you, sorry, doc, I'm not prepared to do that. Here's a really interesting thing about basal metabolic rate, and I'm working more on this at the moment. Part of the basal metabolic rate can only use two macronutrients. I'll go into this a little bit more just here. Remember the work of Tappy saying that if we look at carbohydrates, 5 to 10 percent, we've got this thermic effect of feeding. That's the energy used up making available energy. That's what we're left with. So that's what we're left with after 100 calories of carb, fat, and protein. And the body processes, this then comes from the Bible of Nutrition, Gordon and Wardlaw. The body processes that are things like growth, development, maintenance, and any other body processes, the ones I described in that slide that, that can all shut down, they can't use carbohydrate. Carbohydrate can only be used for energy. Fat is good for anything. Protein will be used for energy, but only as an absolute last resort. It's just too inefficient. It's that 70 to 75% lost in using it up. It's just too inefficient. So fat is your macronutrient most likely to be used up. And as for eating carbohydrates, you sure as anything better be burning them off as fuel. Because if you're not, you're storing them as fat. Now, just that one slide, does it make sense that our government is telling us to have 55% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate? We look now at physical activity level. And given that BMR is such a major proportion of the total energy expenditure, it shouldn't surprise you to know that physical activity level counts for a lot less than we might think. And the physical activity level is, is expressed as a factor. So, for example, most people would have a physical act activity level factor of approximately 1.4, which is you're moderately active, tend to have a sedentary job, so you're not going to scale up your BMR calories by more than that amount. Now, notice that your BMR was taken into account with that physical activity factor. So if you're one of these people that thinks you can burn off what you've just eaten, you need to take something into account. And you need to take into account what you would have been doing anyway. 
because there are a number of slimming clubs. One rhymes with Weight Watchers, and they let you... <laughs> Nothing rhymes with Weight Watchers, let's face it. And they, they think if you do more, to the tune of 164 calories, you can eat 164 more calories. And I've taken that off a standard calories burn website. Average woman, 40 years old, 5 foot 4, 140 pounds, 10 stone, 30 minutes fast walking on the treadmill burns off about a bag of crisps. But she has to take into account what she would have been doing anyway. And if she'd have been sat on the sofa reading Fifty Shades of Grey, she would have burned off 34 calories. So the amount that she could actually treat herself to if she wanted to go down this insane route is actually only 130 calories. How many people are getting on the treadmill and looking at the end and thinking, I've just burned off, it's usually about 75 calories? Well, if you'd have been gardening instead, you probably had a net deficit now. You would have been better off doing your gardening. Thermic effect of feeding. We've looked at that one in terms of the numbers for fat, protein, and carbohydrate. This is what it doesn't take into account. And apologies to David for putting a banana. I had no idea it stressed him so much. <laughs> But the banana is just such a great example because remember we're talking about energy. We're not making the mistake that the psycho team do putting it into weight. So let's say I eat a banana and it's got three and a half teaspoons of sugar. In, that's my small banana, not David's large banana. And we only have a teaspoon of sugar in our bloodstream at any one time. Now you might be a little bit low but you're still not going to be empty. So the most you probably ever need to top up your blood glucose level is less than half a teaspoon of sugar. So I bomb my blood sugar with that one small banana. But let's say I don't need it straight away. So I take some of it away and store it as glycogen. And then I need that glycogen later on. Or maybe I don't need that glycogen later on and it gets stored as fat. And maybe I try to unstore it as body fat the next day. Or maybe I keep storing it as body fat and maybe unstore it a little bit down the line. How much energy is being taken up in all of those processes. The body is not a simple matter of calories in equals calories out. So that takes us into what if the type of energy matters? Now, if we put oil in the coal oven, the original subject of thermodynamics will probably just blow up the steam train. If we put petrol in a diesel car, and for the petrol heads in the audience, no, that's not a diesel car. That's what happens when you ask your husband for a picture of a car for your presentation. <laughs> he likes James Bond's Aston Martin DB5. Pretend it's a diesel car. Put petrol in a diesel car, it doesn't work. Put some of these things in a human body, sucrose. How is sucrose even a food? No essential fats, no complete protein, no vitamins, no minerals. How can we even digest it? Are we digesting it? Is something happening? 400 calories a day of sugar we put into the average human body in the UK and the US. What's happening to that energy? Trans fatty acids. The reason we know that those are so dangerous is that we know we don't metabolize them. They hang around in the body and maybe cause chronic illnesses that could be avoided, but they're sat there as energy in the body. It was energy that went in and it didn't go anywhere. Vegetable oils. If you've got 40 minutes, watch Dr. Michael Eade's presentation from Breckenridge this year, the stuff that he was doing with energy in bonds, vegetable oils, and obesity was absolutely brilliant. What about alcohol? What if we drank 500 grams of alcohol at approximately seven calories per gram? That's about 50 small glasses of wine, by the way. Do we A, gain one pound of fat, or B, die? I think <laughs> it's probably more likely that we die, but it makes a very interesting point. We cannot store alcohol in the human body. We have no storage mechanism. It does not turn into body fat. So don't worry about the calories in alcohol. You do need to worry about alcohol. We'll come on to that in a second, but not for the calories. And then what the heck happens if you don't eat a banana, but you eat those ingredients, many of which I suggest the body has not evolved to consume? That, by the way, is the kind of thing that you do eat if you try to go on a diet. It's still the worst ingredient list product I've ever found, and that was found in about 2009, so almost 10 years now. Weight Watchers still at the top of that one. Does the body function on that kind of thing?
Now, I'm not going to say much about NEAT because non-exercise activity thermogenesis, I kind of think, is a little bit of the cholesterol myth of the low-calorie, calories-in, calories-out world because it seems to have come along quite recently as a way of explaining where some of the calories go because their own energy in, energy out, a la Lisa, isn't working. So they captured this concept of if you're not actually doing exercise, but I've been waving my arms around a little bit during this presentation, that's supposed to be non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And actually then they encourage people to fidget all the time, constantly, because they think somehow you use up calories and lose weight. So I'm not overly impressed with NEAT. I think it's just kind of a bit like cholesterol. It's not cholesterol. It's LDL. It's not LDL. It's the ratio of LDL to this. It's not that. And just, you know, when will you just admit that you were wrong and stop reformulating the theory? Um, I'm not enamoured with this, this one, but I do think that something might be missing. And what might be missing? Well, if the thermic effect of feeding, that nutrients thing, that accounts for the energy used up, but what accounts for the energy lost? Did we capture that in that top total energy expenditure? I think a lot of Lisa's calories are going to heat in the room. But are we capturing that, or is that just the energy lost out of the kettle spout? What is the energy required to actually make body fat? What is the energy required to actually break down body fat, particularly if you keep cycling it in and out during the 24-hour period? How much energy is stored in bonds? And of course, is there a hormone factor? We know, for example, a type 1 diabetic, it doesn't matter what energy you put in, the type 1 diabetic will lose something like a stone in a week or two. Everything is going out of the body. The calorie theorists will try to explain it as sugar is going out of the body in the urine. I'm not sure it accounts for all of the energy. But the but for is surely hormonal. That's the thing that changed. Now, the only thing we can say with that formula is that it will adhere to the laws of thermodynamics. Energy will be conserved and energy will be used up in making available energy and energy will be lost. That's all we can say. We certainly can't say that any of that is going to tell us anything about what happens when we step on the scales. Up until now, I've been talking as if we can actually eat less and do more. But is that even possible? We are here three and a half million years on from our ancestors, Australasius Lucy, because we've been good at two things. One, getting energy, and two, conserving that energy. We have been hardwired to be greedy and lazy. And now we want people to be not greedy and super active. It's counter to everything we've evolved to do. So what's the first thing that happens when you go on a diet, you try to eat less, you get hungry. And immediately you want to eat more. The first thing that happens when you do more is that you want to eat more. If I want to work up an appetite, I go swimming. Works every time. So then you eat less and you will actually want to do less. You can see we're flipping the eat less, do more, showing if you try and do either one, it's actually going to drive you down the route of doing the other one. Eat less, you will have less energy, you will do less. There's a fabulous study on the do more will drive you to do less, and that's the early bird study from the Plymouth team, and they showed with the young children, the children that had the most scheduled exercise in school ended up doing no more activity overall than the kids who had no scheduled exercise because when they got home, they jumped on the bike, picked up the skateboard, and kicked around the streets. So you've got a certain amount that we're going to do. And we do bad things. You need to be aware of, and I know that Jen and Charlotte are going to go into this a bit this afternoon, you need to be aware what calorie counters do if you send them away saying, eat less, do more, because you've got to get a bang for your buck if you're going to go hungry. And you also have this idea that you deserve a reward because it's been so painful and you've punished yourselves. And this is the kind of thing that you do when you try to eat less. And this was my staple when I was a calorie counting teenager. And it's just fabulous because that stuff lasts all day long. I mean, you can graze on those fruit gums. You can make each one last a few minutes, chop your apple up into tiny segments, nibble on the rice cakes. You can make that last all day long. This, half an avocado, a couple of eggs, 15 grams of butter, same 400 calories, couple of minutes to make, couple of minutes to eat. That's fast food. 
look what happens to the macronutrients. I mean, you've got there almost a perfect LCHF, and you've got there an absolutely horrific nutrient void intake because people don't care about quality of food when they're hungry and you're telling them to eat less. And what's energy balance really about? It's about the food companies wanting us to still continue to consume their food, but to burn it off. They don't want us eating less, they want us doing more. And so you'll see in the major companies, they often use words like balance, active lifestyle, they sponsor the Olympics, they sponsor other sporting events. They want to make that connection between eat what you want, you just need to burn it off. And as we know in this room, you can't outrun a bad diet. This guy, Stephen Blair, Professor Stephen Blair, was outed by Anahad O'Connor in a brilliant piece of investigative research, August 2015, series of articles exposing Coca-Cola being behind an organization called the Global Energy Balance Network, which was a way for Coca-Cola to use paid professors, such as this chap, to convince us that energy balance is all about us just doing more exercise. And if you think you can outrun a bad diet, remember our friend Stephen. So if that doesn't work, what does? I think that there's an expression that is as simple as eat less, do more, but it's an accurate one. And I think weight loss is about storing fat and unstoring fat. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to many people in this audience. If you understand what the process of actually losing weight is, it's the body breaking down that, that triglyceride that David talked about just before the break and turning it into available fuel for the body. And to achieve that, we have to do two things. We have to switch off insulin and we have to enable glucagon. Notice I don't say switch on glucagon because we can't switch on glucagon anywhere near as easily as we can switch off insulin. And insulin and glucagon are antagonists. You will not have one present when the other's out playing. So when you've got the yellow lines and you've got insulin storing fat away, taking sugar out of the bloodstream, putting it into glycogen, um, you, on the other hand, if you've got a low blood glucose level, the blue line kicks in and you'll have glucagon waking up, breaking down body fat or going to get some glycogen reserves to top back up the blood glucose system. So we have to work out how to switch off insulin and how to enable glucagon. One of the best ways to switch off insulin is to stop grazing. And I have a little phrase where I say, unless you are a cow or want to be the size of one, <laughs> stop grazing. That's what they do. Let them remind you what happens if you get that habit. Manage carbohydrate intake. We know that protein has an impact on insulin, but it's negligible compared to the impact that carbohydrates have on insulin. So if you want to switch off insulin, you've got to start eating a lot less carbohydrate and with the grazing a lot less frequently. And use the right fuel. We cannot continue putting sucrose, vegetable oils, and those ingredients on that Weight Watchers product into the body on a regular basis, and to think we're actually going to be able to power our steam engines. Now, to enable glucagon, that's the most important thing. You've got to get rid of insulin first. Insulin's there, glucagon's asleep. So manage that size first to enable glucagon. Unfortunately, this is where alcohol does come back in, because I don't think the calories count in alcohol, but we know that alcohol impairs the operation of glucagon. So you enjoy your glass of wine at night, and if you're a natural low carber, your body would be looking at around 3, 4 a.m. to break down some body fat to naturally top up your blood glucose level while you're asleep. If you had alcohol the night before, you've impaired that process. So not only have you impaired your chance of losing weight overnight, nice losing weight while you're asleep, you probably will affect your sleep because you might well wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning hungry because your body wasn't able to do what it was able to do. So the calories don't count, but I'm afraid alcohol does count, guys. And move, because when you've switched off insulin, when you've got less carbohydrate going in and less often, if you start moving, you give your body the opportunity to burn body fat. You give it the opportunity to wake up glucagon, saying get some of that glucose back into the bloodstream. 
I've thrown a lot at you. You've been an absolutely wonderful audience with your listening capacity. So I'm going to try and summarise this in the slide of the messages that I'd like you to be able to take away. Two laws of thermodynamics are important, not just one. And there is no law that says calories in equals calories out, energy in equals energy out. The laws, in fact, say nothing about weight. They are about energy, and they are about the movement of heat. We invented the weight conversion. Maybe Lulu invented the weight conversion. We don't know, but whatever, we got it wrong. It doesn't work for weight gain. It doesn't work for weight loss. The body is not a cash... There's one more if you want to hold the cameras. The body is not a cash machine for fat. The body can and does adjust. And that's the final point. Weight is about fat stored and fat unstored. It's not about energy in equals energy out. And I'm sorry, Anne Widdicombe, much as you're a good sport with your dancing, it's not about eat less and do more. If I haven't convinced you, one of my school friends sent me a fabulous birthday card, and it says the first one to burn off 100 calories wins a bar of chocolate. So if none of what I've said for the last precisely 40 minutes captured your attention whatsoever, then that's the birthday card for you to buy your friends next year. As I say, you have been fabulous. Thank you for listening.